Night falls, and the magic of words is burning firefly-like in the darkness. I am the Gargoyle, your host for this evening session. Coming up in the darkness, we have The Donalds by Monica Lisa Moore. So sit back and enjoy. And as always, the focus is on the words, never on the person behind the camera. And if you like this video, please consider subscribing, ringing that bell, and telling your friends. I would really appreciate it. I am the Gargoyle, your reader on the ledge. Chapter 1 My wife and I were on crystal clothes, a tree-lined access road leading to the watches at the end. We were invited to my father's dinner, and this was his fourth dinner this year. The watches was a gated, mountaintop suburb and we had just stopped in front of its black heavy gate. And even when I also lived in Sage, I hardly came to the watches. Too many memories and shite. The armed guards at the entrance gate, scanning underneath my Toyota Prius for a bomb, and also checking with their iPads whether the two of us were being expected, always pushing a sharp rock up my throat. I shouldn't have come. I've been invited to most, almost every dinner that my father hosted, but I declined each time. I just couldn't stomach my father's bragging about how rich he was. I sometimes suspected that they only invited us to convince themselves that they were nice people. I found it hard to believe that my father really wanted to be around me. He couldn't stand me, and I couldn't stand him. My wife, Rosalie, had been nagging me about attending this dinner since we got our invitation, which was two weeks back. And I had to agree, believe it or not, I'd do anything for my wife. I'd even kill for her, if she asked. Now that this was my reality, I'd be lying if I said I didn't think about cocaine to get me through the evening. Driving in my father's driveway, the thought grew stronger. We were approaching the mansion, and it was massive and beautiful, with its design and details taking you to Italy. All the lights in the house were lit, and the lights outside were lit too, and polishing the bright stone that was the house. There was a roundabout before you reached the mansion, and at the center of the roundabout was a white marbled giant statue of an ancient Greek man was pointing at his heart and wearing a small smile on his lips. The roundabout was a large fish pond, and as a boy, I used to spend hours fascinated by all the fish in it. I drove around the roundabout and left the car near the steps down the front door. We left the car with one of the valet guys hired for the night, and he drove it to the visitor's garage on the other side of the mansion. Then Rosalie and I went up the plethora of steps, going for the wide open door. My wife was limping slightly, and it was a dagger punched into my chest. However, I didn't want to show her that I noticed, for she would have been mad at me. And as if knowing we were coming, Jessica, the witch, appeared from the house. She waited at the top wearing a red dress that gloved her fit body. She was smiling, and I'd be lying if I said she wasn't a beautiful girl. I hated her guts, though, and she knew it. Hello, my sweeties, said the witch. She'd be living in sunny grey from when she was only ten, but the Russian accent was still thick. She was fake, too, but I guess she had to be exceptional at being fake. If she was this impressive as a gold digger. She opened her arms, approaching to hug my wife, and then I kissed her on both cheeks. Even when Jessica was doing that, I could taste the fear in her and noticed how she was distancing herself from me. You look classy, Jess, said my beautiful Rosalie, her voice lovely as always. Ah, thank you, Rose, hesitantly. Jessica was coming to embrace me, and I guess to kiss both my cheeks, as she did to my wife a second back. 
Her scent was flowery, as though she had just left the bath, and the calming scent was the only thing holding me from pushing her down the steps. She would have hit her head on the concrete steps, her legs up in the air as she went down, until the cute little head of hers crushed onto the platform. Blood would have painted the concrete, and her silence, her death, would have been beautiful. I would have killed the bitch, and what a lovely song it would have been. Everyone's inside. Your dad didn't want to start without you, Trey. Don't call me that, I said through my teeth, and Jessica jumped away. Of course, of course, she said, looking down, and I left them there. He's just stressed with work, I heard Rosalie say, making me an excuse as always. Don't worry about it, Jess. Of course, of course. Chapter 2 The entrance hall had a black metal door on the right, and I originally used that lift every day as a kid. Even now, going to the lift brought warmth to my in my chest, reminding me of how perfect life used to be. I took the lift without entertaining the warmth I felt. I took the lift for the third floor, where the private dining room was. We wouldn't be using the dining hall on the ground floor, I knew, for my father would want this gathering to be intimate. My father was a complicated man. He'd be affectionate and considerate all the times, but when, then evil sometimes. The happiness you felt when he was affectionate and considerate wasn't worth the hurt you felt when he was evil, believe me. When I was only 16, he woke me in the middle of the night, telling me to leave his house immediately. He only did it because a gorgeous 21-year-old Jessica, who was a model and a wannabe stylist at the time, said I made her uncomfortable. When I was only 19, my father disowned me, instructing me to never call myself Trey or even Jonathan Donald III again. He said I had shamed him, and at last, even when I was angry, I understood. At that time, gossip magazines and newspapers were on a marathon of publishing photos of me, and they had captured me taking cocaine, fighting at numerous clubs, and fucking some girls at a club's levee. The lift opened in the third floor, opening to show me a newly decorated, colorful sitting area. That was one of the three sitting areas in the house. And I remembered how classy this sitting area used to be, instead of this childish. My sister's voice was laughing, removing my focus from the sitting area. The laugh was coming from somewhere on the right, maybe from near the bar, and I hated that laugh. The laugh sounded almost like my dearest mother's, sweet and genuine. My eyes clouded with tears hearing it and I hesitated leaving the lift, considering going back to my house and play a game with my son. However, I decided on going ahead with it, before they'd say I was being such a bore and excluding myself, when in fact, I wasn't one of them, and I never would be. Hey Jay, being my younger brother Isaac, and the group of five turned my way. Isaac was the best. We hardly visited each other, but he was still the best. My sister Susan was the only one not smiling. The others, including my father's two accountants and the lawyer, were smiling as if I were an old mate. They seemed happy to see me, or maybe too happy now that I thought about it. Isaac was walking to me with open arms, and a wide grin was on his face. He was wearing a black smart tuxedo with a black bow tie on the white shirt. His jacket was unbuttoned, revealing a black smart waistcoat. And even when we both had thick bronze hair, his was styled in a fashionable businessman cut when my Ivy League was just too tired. Sometimes, which only happened on my low days, I'd be ashamed to be even seen with Isaac. I wasn't ashamed of him, of course but I was ashamed of myself. 
His attire for that day for that day would be sharper and far more expensive than my attire for that day. It'd be weird on my part when he'd claim me in front of everyone as his brother and his best friend, when others like Susan would have pushed me away, telling me not to follow them. How's it going, man? said Isaac, hugging me. Whilst rubbing his hand against my back, he sighed heavily, as though with relief. Fine. How about you? Good, good. He looked at me, his green eyes bright with excitement under his Armani spectacles. He took me with an arm and led me towards the group. I brought my girlfriend, big bro, he said with a quiet voice, so no one could hear. I brought her so you check her out and tell me what you think. I want to marry this one, but shh, don't tell anyone yet. Chapter 3 It wasn't the first time Isaac had brought me his girlfriend to approve, and I always approved without examining. But it was the first time he brought me one that he wanted to marry. The girl wouldn't last, or at least history told me that. We were now getting closer to the group, and Larry, the lawyer, stretched out his hand for me. It's good to see you, Jay, he said, his eyes never shying away. The man was checking whether I was still clean, even when I never made it his business. Unlike the accountants, I'd interacted with a man, and I had to, since I had serious problems with the law in the past. The first time I even saw Larry was when I almost killed a man. It was self-defense. and That is how Larry convinced the guy not to sue. And of course, my father paid the guy's medical bills when I refused to. Believe me, I never heard the end of it. I still regretted not paying the fucking bills. Larry was a great lawyer, and from what I witnessed, but he'd frustrate you sometimes, telling you over and over that what losing the case would mean. By the end of the day, I was so frustrated that even when it was self-defense, I got scared when the guy landed in ICU at Oakman Central Hospital, the best hospital in Sunny Gray. That guy was a moron. It turned out that he was actually dead by a stupid friend to cause me trouble, saying he wouldn't last a minute fighting me. I still remember that night. Rose and I were at some posh club, VIP of course, since we were millionaires then, and the guy came to our table. He started insulting Rose before slapping her on the face, and to make sure that I didn't get the opportunity to defend my woman's honor. The guy immediately jumped to me with a punch, punching me back to my seat. He knew I'd be coming for him. He rushed to punch me again, and I started kicking so that I wouldn't have a chance. However, I did get a chance. I grabbed his leg and pulled him to the seat, where I punched him until he was unconscious. And I didn't realize that the guy was unconscious, but until Rose grabbed me away from him. If it wasn't for Rose, I would have killed that guy. Thanks, I said, shaking Larry's hand. I then shook everyone's hand, but gave my sister a hug. Blah, you smell awful, Jonathan, she said, pushing me away from her, and then pressed her nose shut with her fingers. She drank her cocktail and moved it around her mouth, as if though cleaning the stench of my daughter's nappy. She even straightened her expensive grey suit jacket, as if though my cheap and somewhat oversized suit had ruined hers. I always wondered how James, her husband, coped with her. Susan had always been a terrible person. I never told her, but I hated her. She called Jessica mum, and as a child, she even clung by Jessica's side and hid behind Jessica as if though she never had a mother of her own. Yes, she was only four when my mother died, but that didn't mean she had to betray mum, that trashy girl. Your dad would be right back, said one of the accountants, and I nodded. He's uh, giving a tour. 
giving the tour was had be, always been my father's thing. He was the arch, was an architect by training and the CEO of the Jonathan Donald Company by profession. He'd go on for hours talking about his design processes and what inspired each detail of a building. I didn't envy those who were given the tour. It was horrible, I knew. Where's Rose, bro? said Isaac, holding my shoulder, and his Rolex couldn't be ignored. I pawned all my Rolex watches and opted for a small black Casio. Babies were expensive, and my salary was a slap on the face. And I killed my trust fund by the age of 23. Coming, I said, and noticed how awkward I must have looked with my hands in my pockets. To have something to do, I went to the nearby table for a bottle of beer. But whilst there, I decided to leave for my old room. Where do you think you're going, Jonathan? Leave him, Susie, said Isaac, as I passed through the cozy bar on the left of the hallway. It's still his home. Chapter 4 I took the stairs sipping at my beer. The steps were marble, and they were beautiful as I'd remembered. They curved at the end of the left, going up the fourth floor of the mansion. It was quiet, and I loved the calming feeling of being alone. But I could still hear my father's raspy voice from somewhere in the third floor. He was selling someone a dream of owning a few islands. He was in the process, or negotiations, of buying one, and would get the other five islands early next year. The hallway in the fourth floor was longer and brighter, but longer and brighter than I'd remembered. All the antique lamps on the white walls on either sides of the doors were lit, and the gold in their steel made the house appear luxurious, even when it was as comfortable as any other home. My last time in this house was a few months back, but I hadn't been in the fourth floor for a long time. As I approached the eighth room on the right, my old room, I smiled, seeing that Warren Buffett's poster was still pasted on the door. I was surprised that my father hadn't removed the poster. It was one of the sweetest things. I pushed the light grey door, went in, and flipped up the light switch near the door. The famili familiarity of the room was comforting. Even when the room was kept clean, it's though it hadn't been touched. The large bed on the left, under a poster of the pre knighted Richard Branson, was still covered with my blue duvet. My books were still on the cozy desk near the window across the room. Posters half of half naked girls were still up on the walls. Even the smell was still there, or a wealthy me at least. I took a sip at the beer, wait, walking to sit on the desk. I opened the drawer for the journal my mother gave me when I was eleven, a few months before she passed away. The journal was important to me, and because I was still mourning then, I didn't use it until after the first anniversary of my mother's passing. The buildings I sketched just to impress my father were in every page. The sketches were undetailed, childish, and terribly uninspired. My father was right, for he had said exactly those words after I filled every page with a sketch. I still remember that day perfectly. My father was in his office, the home office, and was busy sketching a building that became King's Lean Tower, now changed to the Lean Tower. The building had to be beautiful, safe and inexpensive, and he was working hard to solve that. Even a year after my mother had passed, my father was still sad about it, and I thought showing him what I was capable of would cheer him up. Instead, with my flipping the pages over his desk, he only glanced at my work and said those undetailed, childish, and ter terribly uninspired words before instructing me to go back to my room and work harder than I did. Those weren't the words I wanted to hear. It was a harsh criticism, but it didn't stop me from sketching. Sketching, sketching basically became my life. 
other than fucking and clubbing, since sketching brought me goals somehow. I sketch one thing after another, and throwing the sketchbooks away. But one, my last sketchbook. The sketchbook was on the desk and placed alone, away from the other books, as if though my father spent his time here, checking my work all the years I was away. That would have been interesting. Wishful thinking, yes, but still interesting. I took the sketchbook from the desk. The sketchbook had a thick black cover and its pages were brown instead of white. Those, these sketches were better by a mile. Unlike the journal, the sketchbook had other things beside buildings. Mona Lisa was on the first page and the rest had beautiful girls and beautiful cars, but mostly girls. Even when most of the old sketches were faces, there were others where I'd sketched full bodies, naked, full bodies. There was one sketch of a naked girl that I always loved, a sketch of a younger Rosalie pleasuring herself. I switched on my old desk lamp and adjusted it to look down at the young girl. The details of her vagina made it appear almost real and my dick got hard. What impressed me the most is the fact I sketched it from memory. I was in this very chair, hunched over this very desk. That day, Rose and I fucked almost every crazy position we found in her Kama Sutra. Now looking back, I found it funny how I never imagined that being with this crazy girl would mean a sex-starved marriage later on. The truth people never bothered to think you needed to hear is that babies were a gift, but they could easily be a curse too. Ah, I always loved that one, said Jessica's strong Russian accent from behind. Guys, that is this for this evening's session. If you enjoyed this, I will be placing links below and you can check out Mona's rest of her work. I really enjoyed reading this and I'll see you next time. Again, please subscribe, like, comment, and I'll see you next time in the darkness. As always, I am the Gargoyle, your reader on the ledge.